are having an event on the 24th. Everyone got a flyer, I'm pretty sure. It's entitled Black America State of Emergency. And we're going to be talking about the issues that are affecting Black America and America as a whole. Um, we still have open slots if people wanted to um, do workshops. And we're going to put a link on the website for the workshop proposal. Everyone is invited um, so we can kind of come together as a community and um, figure out what's hindering us, not only as a black community, but also uh, America as a whole. So thank you for your time. Everybody enjoy the event. What the day is the 24th? 24th of May. From, from, eight, from 8 to 5, all day. Where is it? Uh, Kramer Hall. Um, there's like 12 or 13 different rooms. 371 is the main room, so if you come to Camera Hall, 371. Thank you. Didn't need the, she didn't need the mic, so I guess I didn't need the mic. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ethan Johnson, and I'm an assistant professor in the Black Studies Department. And what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about the Black Bag Speaker Series before we get started, and I introduce people and uh, say some thank yous to some people. Um, Summer of 2005, we were sitting around in the Black Studies Department trying to think about what could we do to uh, really try to create a space for um, issues in the black community in Portland to have a place here on campus, a forum. And uh, Daryl Milner, who's the really the foundation of the Black Studies Department, I think I could say he started it, he made it, you know, it is what it is today because of him. And uh, he's, you know, he said, well, why not? somebody mentioned the brown black bag. And you know, Daryl looked at us and he said, well, why don't we call it a black bag? And there, that's how it came about. And so um, we got a grant from, ooh, I can't remember the name of the department, but it's uh, Academic Excellence. It was the uh, Department of Academic Excellence, Excellence here in PSU. And uh, they gave us a grant in 2005. And in 2006, we were up and running. We've had up to today, we've had, this will be the 13th event. We've done about anywhere from six to four a year, um, from 2006 fall to right now. Uh, what else? So again, this is uh, an event that tries to bring communities and activists, community, community activists and people trying to address issues that are very pertinent to black people and the communities of black people in Portland and bring them here to have a discussion and engage faculty and students. Uh, I want to say some thank yous because this event could not happen without them. First I want to say um, the, uh, this event is sponsored by the NAACP Portland State University chapter, student chapter. Uh, the food would not be here without them, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I also want to say thank you to um, the Multicultural Center, who has also helped us uh, in organizing this event. They've given me a uh, graduate student uh, assistant who's here right here, my Yoka, and she does helps me with a lot of the stuff that just getting people here, um, helping me organize the food, seating, easels that are here, you know, she's, she does a lot of that work for me. Um, thank you. And uh, finally, the Black Studies Department. We're, uh, it came out of the Black Studies Department. We're not um, putting too much uh, in terms of funding. We don't have a lot, so we're, we're depending on those organizations to help us keep this thing going. Uh, so, with that, I want to introduce the two people who are part of this event today. I, what I've tried to do is at some of the events, I've tried to give an opportunity for students to, um, who are artists, primarily singers, uh, painters, uh, who else have I? I've also had people from outside the community, some mu musicians come in. And just to open the event and not have it be strictly kind of an academic setting, I've invited a number of people here. And Mo actually has been before. She's a uh, are you a graduate student now? Or? I will be after this term. Next term, she'll be a graduate student here in the art department. She's, um, uh, she, uh, her work is, I think, kind of self, is self explanatory. She focuses on black people, and uh, I've always been very attracted to it. I, I really love the boldness of it. Um, I'm gonna, she's gonna speak a little bit about 
her motivations and talk about maybe some of the pieces that are here. You're going to have a few minutes to ask her some questions, possibly buy a piece if you want to. And, uh, and then we're going to get into our main speaker of, of today, who is uh, um, Hannah Hurdle Tume. Uh, if you have read the flyer, uh, she is um, going to speak today about a book that she's writing. It's called More Than a Slave which recounts the, her father's history, uh, who was a slave, and I think she's going to give us a little background on that, because I think sometimes we may have trouble with the numbers there. And uh, she's, so she's, really, she's going to recount that book. Um, Hannah was our first speaker for the Black Bag Speaker Series. And she also she, she spoke on a, a similar, I don't think it was directly from her book, but it was bring, talking about many of the issues that she uh, um, uh, that she talked about in that first event. Um, she is a, uh, she's a great speaker, and she's very engaging, and I'm really glad to have her back here today. And I'm sure you, you're going to enjoy her too, and I hope you have lots of questions for her. So why don't we start first with Mo. Uh, Mo, the floor is yours. Everybody can give her a hand. So I didn't write any great conversation or speeches because I forget them when I get up here in the morning. I get really nervous. I had the pleasure of opening for Avell last year. The relevancy between Hannah's work and mine is history. I use art and the way that I document it. Musicians, other artists, they are preservers of our history, which tends to get left out of the history books. The combination or the way it's connected, she's discussing how her father was a slave and I'm trying to get rid of a new slave mentality that ends up with a lot of our children being in prison. There are other alternatives in life. One is to be an artist. I use the people that I paint who are also in their own right historians. E.B. King, Nina Simone, Bill Scott Heron, uh, Miles Davis. I use it as personal therapy. The one in the back is I'm the warrior of love. I'm here to share and give love. If we promote that instead of the evil that's out in the world, we might actually make some changes. Um, I'm also the very first African American Visual Arts Fellowship recipient here at Portland State. I was the only one for the first three years. This year they now have two more. They're both girls. Why I'm bringing this up is the relevancy of we don't promote to our young men the concept that you can paint, that you can create. We give them this idea that they can be ballers, they can be rap stars, or they can that's unfortunately in the news. We don't talk about being lawyers, about being doctors, about being historians even. There's other alternatives. Since getting this scholarship, I have created the Artist Group Community. It's a group show that shows down in the Pearl District every month. I don't charge my artist fees or commissions. What I demand they do is they have a local charity that they give back to, either in time or in money, in some way helping out, showing that we as artists care about the community that we live in. I also started teaching out of the Juvenile Detention Center because that is where it's needed the most, down at the bottom, where it's the last chance to save somebody from becoming a new member of that new plantation. Um, questions? I'm, <laughs> I'm getting really nervous, so. <laughs> done? Am I done? Um, are you still on your hiding work? Um, I actually just. I just took them down from everywhere, but as I was mentioning, I um, curate the shows down in the Pearl District, and I show every month in that. We take over the Albina Community Garage. It's, it's a huge indoor, about a little bit larger than this. We throw 20 artists in there, some live music, spoken word, all local artists. It's my way of connecting with other people I know and helping them get shown, sharing the help that I've received, kind of passing it forward. Um, I'm also, actually, I just curated the Due North show over at ISCC this year where we honored uh, Claire Memory and Asaka Samsudin. There's some of your local artists, amazing men. They're familiar. You should know them. Um, and in that, we had uh, 76 artists and 14 poets. I found out we're doing too much at one time. <laughs> but I made it work, and we honored them, and it was beautiful. On the tables, I put one copy. Hopefully, you'll share them of um, the scholarship. Let me grab this real quick. Information. If you know young men or young women who are artists or have an idea that they want to be, that they draw, this scholarship has gives them at least the opportunity of a year free education. They are the documenters of our history. 
there, there are, we are our ancestors' keepers and our children's teachers. Those are our jobs, and we have to do that because if we wait for someone else to define us, we cannot complain about the image that they create. And we will be step and fetch it, and we'll be the first one dead, we'll be the last one to know what's going on. We have to preserve our own history, our own image. It's up to us. What's your website? Uh, Continue.to forward slash ammo. It's on the cards on the table. I put those on the table already too. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that you know to teach in and do it as a catcher. Yes. How are uh, how are the brothers and sisters responding to that? And do you get a lot of them resistance from the authorities or the There is some there is some uh, resistance. They um I've been doing it since January and now all of a sudden they need to do a background check on me. But um, as far as the kids go, I'm actually pretty clean dressed up today. Those who know me around here, I'm normally covered in paint. <laughs> so the kids already are kind of curious about what's going on and I do that on purpose. I had someone tell me once that the way I dress people wouldn't take me serious. And I thought about it and a doctor wears his outfit to work that he wears and a lawyer wears his and a nurse wears hers and I'm an artist and that's what I do and I am very serious about it. So I rock my colors, I paint, and I don't do that. I wish you to paint, but <laughs> I've normally got it on me somewhere. I make it very clear that I'm very serious about what I do. Yes? I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about each piece that was up and also... No. <laughs> the name of each piece. Um, and, also, and one other thing is just talk a little bit about your lineage as an artist or the people who came before you. Oh, well, Asaka Sanchez, I'll start there, is my mentor. And Asaka was taught by Jacob Lawrence don't know who Jacob Lawrence is, again, get familiar. He's an amazing artist historically. That means I'm third generation under Jacob Lawrence. That is an honor. This is amazing. It's real. When I realized that, I did some independent study with Avell where um, one of the things that's been a problem while studying here at Portland State is that all of my art classes have been, forgive me, white. <laughs> Our models have been white, the teachers have been white, the people we've studied have been white. And any time I brought some color into the room, they were like, why do you feel like you need to do that? And because it needs to be known. It's not black history, it's our history. Thank you. All Thank of our you. history. Everything that's happened in this country is our history. And we get past the color that's on the outside. If you cut us, we all believe the same. We're human. Um, the pieces that I have here, I mentioned some of the names. Phoebe, Phoebe King, Who Do You Love? Gil Scott Corona, It's a Lovely Day, Nina Simone. Um, because you're mine, uh, <laughs> my Oak Davis, So What, uh, Kind of Blue song and title from the album. This is a self-portrait. I use it as self-therapy a lot, so you see there's some of a lot of mine if you go on the website. It's the way I work out my issues. My wife's kind of thought that it's nice. I can work it out here, and then someone's actually going to buy it instead of having to go pay a shrink, so I was, <laughs> the more problems I got technically, the better, right? <laughs> so this is uh, Reflections of Self, and the history behind this one is the, on my business card as well, is it's a sketch of myself, I draw on the train a lot. Um, wearing a hat that I paint with kids, I take hats that have labels like Nike and Adidas and the things that our children are sold as being art that we mark and label ourselves with, and we cover them up. We talk about other artists, we talk about different styles of art, and then we create our own labels and we identify ourselves. So in this, I'm wearing a hat with me and my headphones, so you know me, I'm always attached as well, telling myself to be true to myself. The hat's called self, just to remind me to be true to myself. So it's a painting of myself, it's a drawing of myself in a window wearing a hat, reminding myself to stay true to myself, which I turn into a painting, Reflections of Self. Basically just reminding myself over and over again. Um, the one over here behind with the leaf across the mouth, that's of kings and queens. Um, that one's actually donated to the Black Studies Department. The one next to it, playing off of Gil uh, Heron, is um, the revolution will not be televised. We're still warriors. Because we're not, you know, in the older days, having to fight with spears in our hands or guns or whatever else. We're still fighting. We're fighting for our right to be free. We're not free yet. No. You've been bamboozled if you think you are. Right. And then the one in the back, that is warrior of love. And that's another self-therapy thing. Again, I'm working on making sure that I share love. Can I be done now? Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs>
there's a there's an event on campus today at 4 p.m. that I just wanted you to be aware of. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Ramona Africa, but she belongs to an organization called Move. And uh, the best, the only way I can kind of, some of you are probably too young, but uh, and, uh, and I think it was the late 80s. Uh, they were in Philadelphia. They are a, I don't know how to describe them, but um, the Black Liberation Organization. Um, and the police bombed their house and all of the kind of neighboring blocks burned down. You know, the dropped from a helicopter, they dropped a bomb on their house and a couple city blocks burned down. And um, a number of the, uh, they call them the Move Nine and they've been in prison for, since that time, and not been, they, they're accused of killing a police officer. And the one person who wasn't put in prison, I believe, is her name is Ramona Africa, and she's gonna be here Today she's speaking on in the park box at four o'clock. Uh, if anybody wants to see, hear somebody talk about and kind of encapsulate all the problems that are facing this country besides its race, um, I invite you to go listen to Rwanda Africa. I thought that was going to be a one. Yeah, that's a one. Rally at three thirty. The email I got said four, but maybe it's that one. Because something I saw said one, so you think it's four instead? The email I got, that's, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, also, I just wanted to plug a course that I'm teaching next term, which is called Racism. And uh, it is out of the Black Studies Department. It is a 416, 516 course. And if anybody here is interested in pursuing uh, uh, that topic and is interested in it, um, please talk to me. and. Or if not, sign up for the course. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our main speaker, um, Hannah Earl Tumay. I'm going to invite you to the podium, <coughs> or would you rather? No. Just... You're welcome to sit there too. No, no, no. I want to sit. Could you please welcome Hannah? How's that? Is that a good? Okay. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you. To share with you an overview of my book, More Than a Slave. The subtitle is Andrew Jackson Hurdle's Children Recount His Life. It is a biography, and it is a work in progress that has been for four years. <laughs> oh, and I am the biographer and the youngest daughter. And the recount, recurring theme in the book is father's perseverance and his persecution. They seem to go together. If Andrew Jackson Hurdle were alive today, he would be 163 years old. <laughs> he could describe life on the plantation. He could describe his excitement of being a runaway slave and the jubilation of the Emancipation Day. Father died in 1935, when death silences the last African-American former slave. <laughs> Will their history lie beside them in the grave? Their stories must be told. One former slave gave this advice, quote, if you want to write a book about Negro history, you have to get it from someone who wore the shoe. 
and by and by, from one to the other, you get a book, end quote. Our father wore the shoe of slavery on his foot and the vexatious yoke of chattel slavery around his neck. So this book, More Than a Slave, recounts these experiences and the noteworthy manner in which Andrew Jackson Hurdle survived. Andrew Jackson Hurdle, my father, begot 25 children. But my 81-year-old brother, Chester, who's <coughs> relaxing down at Carmel with his wife today, his wife of 60 years, my brother Chester and I are the sole survivors. Therefore, the exigency of completing Father's biography is obvious. We are trying to finish the book before our own demise. I am the second person in our family to actually compile Father's biography. In 1975, our sister Hattie Perilla Hurdle Zoller published her extensive book about our family history. That was quite an undertaking for our 80-year-old sister. Neither Hattie nor I have could have compiled this biography without our family's additional information. They shared conversation with our fathers, with our father, his personal letters and other priceless memorabilia. Hattie and I are extremely grateful to our, in quotes, family archivist, brothers Timothy and Isaiah. I must tell you a little about Isaiah. Father named him, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> They said, Ella, her, you, you can't just name him, I quit. <laughs> so they kind of stretched him out to Isaiah quit. <laughs> but he didn't quit either. He had four more children after that. <laughs> Isaiah was the 13th child. <laughs> For years, our brothers cataloged the scribbled notes and the faded sheets of paper from family reunions and the endless numbers of mimeograph genealogies. Those of you that are old enough to remember what <laughs> mimeographs were, everything came out smudged with print and ink and everything together on them. Timothy shared with us Father's captivating stories. Father recounted his narrow escapes from danger. And with a twinkle in his eye and suppressed glee, Father described his escape from Master, Master Hurdle's plantation. More Than a Slave is a wholesome book. There is no profanity in it, no slang. It is not enhanced in any way. Everything is true and verifiable. There are no scandalous family secrets to rouse your curiosity and to infuriate our relatives. Is this a boring book then? No, no, no. Hmm? Oh, I thought somebody said yes. <laughs> no, I think that More Than a Slave is a captivating story. It's a folksy style of, regard, of recording our history. That's an introduction to what the book is all about. Slavery, the simony of human beings, chattel slavery, quote, a slave shall be deemed chattel personal in the hands of his owner, end quote. His owner, yes. One owner said without compunction, quote, I purchased four women and ten children as much my property as my brood mares, end quote. Slavery. How much misery is comprehended in that single word? What mind is there that does not shrink from its direful effects? End of quote. These are the words of Henry Highland Garnett, who escaped from slavery in 1824. 
Thirty years after Henry spoke these words, the effects of chattel slavery reached its treacherous tentacles into our grandparents' close-knit family. Steve and Hannah watched helplessly as their children were seized and sold. Even their youngest child, Andrew, was not spared his turn on the auction block. Stephen and Hannah were enslaved on Master Hurdle's plantation in North Carolina. There were no legal marriages for slaves and no birth certificates for the six children of our grandparents. They, were, they didn't have a birth certificate because they belonged to the master, Master Hurdle. Therefore, Master Hurdle did not have to explain why he was selling the children. George, Henderson, Andrew, Hannah, Luvenia, and Lucinda Jane. Who can describe grandma and grandpa's unconsolable grief? Watching their loving children go away with strangers. Perhaps they prayed silently for them because they would be beaten if they wept for their children. Their location where they were being taken, unknown. They had no way to search for them later because their names were changed. From Hurdle to Hazel to Holt or whoever owned them next. Quickly, the bidding soon robbed Hannah and Steve of all their children. Master H bought five older children to serve in the big house on his plantation. We have photos of the big house where they served and also the courthouse or the trading post where my beloved aunts and uncles were sold. Our father, young Andrew, was promptly sold to Master T, who wanted a playmate for his young son. Andrew was taken the farthest away, 2,000 miles away to Dangerfield, Texas. Remember, he's just a little boy, seven or nine years old. His bare feet following behind his new master and his big tears falling on them, as if to plead with his parents to please save me. They could not. He began his life of servitude alone, surrounded by strangers in a strange place. Imagine your seven-year-old being taken away from you from the soccer field, and he had to go into the fields to harvest vegetables or something. You never saw him again. He never saw you. You didn't know where he was. Steve and Hannah shambled down the muddy path to their dark, dank, and empty cabin. Their children's fate was unknown, and their own future was uncertain. I close this chapter chapter one, which is called Sold and Gone. And I close it with excerpts from John Greenleaf Freer's poem. John, <laughs> you know the guy. John Greenleaf Whittier's poem, The Farewell. Gone, gone, sold and gone. There no mother's eye is near them. There no mother's ear can hear them. Gone, gone, sold, and gone. Yes, our parents' grandchildren were gone, but where? Where was Mr. B's plantation? Was Henderson, no one child escaped, Henderson Hurdle, and he escaped. So when Master counted his children, he had four instead of five. And we learned later that he, they were treated very harshly. When they were on Master Hurdle's plantation, at least not one of Hannah and Steve's children had ever been whipped in any way, or beaten, or anything like that. Mr. 
But the other four children then, they were in the hands of a very cruel master. And what about little Andrew? Andrew had a kind master who treated him like a member of their family. He even let Andrew keep the hurdle surname. And he was living fine on Master T's plantation until, now he's in his teens by now, uh, the new overseer decided to whip all the slaves just to prove that he had the right to do so. Just whip them. Just beat them to the blood. You tie them to a pole like this. And they have to bear their backs and just beat and beat and beat until he got, the, he got his satisfaction out of it. And when he came to Andrew Jackson Hurdle, a sagacious, sagacious, obedient young man, he was not going to tolerate such an affront to his personhood. So it was the overseer, not Andrew, that got a sound beating from my father. <laughs> now Andrew knew that, he knew the formula well. Fight with white equals flight. He knew he had to flee for his life. Because once the word got out that he had beaten severely the overseer, he was a dead man. <coughs> so he was quite a, while, quite a long time roaming from place to place, but finally ended up in a Union Army camp. And there he stayed until emancipation. The second chapter of the book covers his freedom, his marriage, and his progress after that. The first thing he did was look for his sweetheart, Viney. And they were married legally on a piece of paper uh, for the first time, and they began their life together. When the slavery ended, millions of other Texas slaves, because he was living in Texas, remember, and they were the last ones to be free because they, they had the surrender and then uh, the Texas slaves, they got two more years of work out of them from 1863 to 1865. So the Texas slaves, with unfettered feet, walk through the opportunity's golden door. They breathe freedom's exhilarating air and, and took a life of ease, sat down. I'm glad that cotton patch and the whip is over. I can sit down and take my ease. No. They had, they had to get busy. They were set free empty-handed, 400 years of unrequited uh, labor. How are you going to start? With what? I'm going to change now from biographer to vignetta. <laughs> I want to put this little vignette before you to illustrate the complexities of post-slavery and that era. To those who did not wear the shoe of slavery and were the farthest from its atrocities, are proud to glibly say, get over it! When are you black folks going to get over slavery? I mean, get over it. You're free, aren't you? No. <laughs> this is a quote. To suppose that slavery, the accursed thing, could be abolished peacefully and laid aside innocently after having plundered cradles, separated husbands and wives, parents and children, and after having starved to death, whipped to death, run, run to death, burned to death, lied to death, kicked and cuffed to death, grieved to death. To forget this, all of that suffering would be the greatest ignorance under the sun." End quote. All the slaves suffered, even the house slaves that were supposed to have had it easier. Many died. But African-American slaves, many of them did survive. We are a surviving people. Our father, Andrew Jackson, did suffer. He was sold. He was separated. He was a motherless child. But he survived. 
In the words of Langston Hughes, changing the I to we, I share this poem with you. I'm still here. We have been scarred and battered. My, our hopes the wind done scattered. Snow has frizzed us. Sun has baked us. Look like between them, they done tried to make us stop laughing, stop loving, stop living. But we don't care. We are still here. Let me ask you, if you, like Father and other freedmen, were emancipated with no financial assets but your freedom and your strong back that you got for working for Master, mm -hmm. where would you start? Land, land, give us land, was the freedmen's cry, and A.J. Hurdles, too. One slave said, former slave, give us land, and we take care of ourselves. But without the land, Massa can hire us or starve us as he pleases, end quote. You see now why we must have something? Those who don't have anything are at the mercy of those who do. So that's the first thing Father set out to do. And one year after his, uh, his emancipation, he owned over 500 acres of land. He didn't change the deeds. He worked with both races. He worked with the white races in Greenville, building their log cabins and all of that. He's an excellent carpenter. Then he went down the road eight miles and helped the colored folks build their community, working together. No isolation, no grudges, no you did this to me and blah, blah, blah. He worked with both. And by the end of 1966, he had over 500 acres of land. I still have my land today. But what were the options for the others? They were given limited options. You could sit around and wait for the 40 acres and a mule that never materialized. You could relocate to one of the five states where 80 acres of inferior land waited for you after you bought the tools with what? Now remember you were empty handed. You bought the tools, you brought the draft animal, you relocated to this place and worked the land for five years. Then you would be given by, uh, 80 acres of inferior land. So what does a man do? Langston Hughes again gives us a hint. When a man starts with nothing, when a man starts with his hands empty but clean, when a man starts out to build a world, he starts first with himself and the faith that is in his heart, the strength there, the will there to build, end quote. Now he could have shared crops doing most of the labor for the least amount of, of, of the profit. But Father did not wait. He didn't wait for the 40 acres and a mule. He did not relocate to get 80 acres. Father had worked for 50 years without a salary for the church. He applied for his $4 pension in 1926, and his application was clearly marked, colored, Andrew Jackson Hurdle colored. So, <laughs> so it was five years, and he still hadn't gotten anything. So 1931, he says, hmm, I've got to apply. So he wrote another letter himself. I'm old, I'm sick, I'm having bladder trouble. And my wife is kind of sickish too, um, in the morning mostly. <laughs> uh, she must be biggest. <laughs> So father did not mention then that despite his feebleness, he was expecting his 25th child. So wow. I, I've given you the over, overview, and I have shared it with you, but you're going to write the conclusion yourself. 
If you were a man, you're an eight, you have eight more children, you have your land, you're feeble, you can't even walk and barely talk, would you sell some of your land to make that sure that your last few days were in ease? Well, what would you do? Don't ask. <laughs> yeah. uh, if you were mother trying to raise eight little children without going out of the home, she never worked outside the home, what would you do? Number one, go back to your wealthy parents and send Paul off to his older children, pass the hat around and ask all of them to contribute. <laughs> what would you do? So you write the conclusion. That's the story. Thank you. questions in the five minutes that we have left. <laughs> Any questions that you might have? Anybody? Yes. Does your book actually tell us the end? Or? Oh, but of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh definitely. It's a sad ending, though. Oh, oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Yes. I came across some research that said that you are participating in a, like a corporate slavery reparations bill. Yes. I was wondering um, if you could share anything about that. That is a total nightmare. <laughs> Go to reparations or just put her on the, uh, on whatever you all do on the internet things. I don't touch them. Ten foot pole. Yeah. But uh, there are some, uh, lots of articles about our family and one of those pictures has from the reparation. We've been covered in 17 journalists. 17 journalists have covered our story, and include, including Nikkei of Japan came all the way over and did our story too. Yes. Why is it so hard to about 10 or 12 attorneys working on this case still. It has been thrown out, it has been discredited. Oh, I put on a real show one day on CNN with my bale of cotton, these seeds of greed and all of this. It was nice. But the thing of it is, we're in denial. We, we just don't talk about that. Don't upset us with that. Why don't you people get over it? You know, just get over it. Goodness, I mean, it's trying to send my children to Harvard. Paying for some money, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. It's a matter of denial, mostly. It didn't happen. The judge, when he threw the case out the first time in the Chicago court, he just turned his back on our attorney and and uh, just walked out. He didn't recuse himself. He didn't do anything. He just threw it out. And uh, that was a really dramatic thing. I said, "Oh, that's wonderful the way you walked out standing in the federal building. That is great." He said, "Huh? What?" I said, this is what we've been having for 400 years, the disrespect for our people. It was in the pitch. I'm sorry. I did a good one. I don't want to talk okay. over anyone else, but I have another question. So why is it 